You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Nuno Palma. He is Assistant Professor of Economics, Econometrics, and Finance at the University of Groningen. Okay, Nuno, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thank you very much for inviting me. So our topic for today is the monetary history of England. Nuno, you have a paper that reconstructs England's money supply from 1270 to 1870. How did you manage to go back so far? Okay, so, well, uh, first of all, the, the point of that paper is more general than England in particular, although I was interested in the application of England. Um, but uh, it's mostly about the methodology behind that can indeed be applied to other countries if the necessary data exists for those other countries. But to answer your question, how did I manage to go so far back in time? Um, the key is to understand that there are some periods in, in England's history in this case for which we actually know the stock of money supply to a reasonable degree of precision. This could have been, for instance, because they recoined the entire money supply. And if they recoin everything, then in that year, you have sort of a picture of how much it was. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have certain pictures through history, moments in which you know, or you approximately know money supply, um, often coin supply only, and then at some later moments, broader measures of money supply as well. And so what I I did mostly in that paper is to come up with a way to fill the blanks between those pictures. Okay. Uh, and you use a, a sort of um, an estimate of uh, the velocity of money to do that. Could you talk about how that works? Uh, sure. I, I propose more than one method. The, the method you are uh, referring to is the so-called indirect method. But I, I don't know if you want this discussion to become too technical. Uh, te uh, technical is okay, uh, <laughs> as long as we define our terms. Okay, so basically um, there is a direct method which uses data on mint output, uh, which can be used to reconstruct coin supply, so to say. And so that basically gives us the flows every year. I mentioned previously that uh, we know the stocks for some years. And the key is how do you then transform occasional stocks into stocks for every year. And we do know s flows for every year. Those, fo those flows uh, are not free of problems. There are some double counting problems with just summing flows over time that I explain in the paper. Um, but those flows can, with corrections, be used in order to transform uh, some occasional stocks into yearly stocks. And then one big advantage is that after a few years, we get a new picture, a new stock that is, so to say, the truth, and we can check. Uh, so we can we can be, be sure that we are anchored once in a while and never get too far out. So this is the direct method. It, has, it does not use velocity. An alternative method, which I also propose, on which the estimates can be compared with the direct method, is a method that uses essentially nominal GDP, because now we have uh, good estimates for England's nominal GDP far back in time at the annual level. And so using the familiar um, quantity of exchange, also sometimes known as, known as Fisher equation, we can, um, we can simply use uh, moments at, for which we have, we actually know the money supply to infer velocity at those moments. And then by interpolating those velocities, we can then plug back in those velocities into the equation for the years we don't have money supply and using nominal GDP, retrieve money supply for those years. So there's nothing tautological about this because we are using either velocity or money supply for different years, depending on whether we can observe money supply for that particular year or not. Okay, so when we talk about velocity, we mean, you know, the, how, how many transactions is, is a, you know, given coin or, or uh, unit of currency gonna, gonna go through in your typical year. And so if we have some idea of, you know, how much trade is going on, and then, then we can uh, sort of try to infer from 
nominal GDP, as you say, back to the amount of coins that must be uh, present or the the amount of uh, precious metals, at least in the earlier period. Of course, uh, you're, you're looking at such a, a broad span of time. 1270 is, you know, this sort of the just a hundred years after William the Conqueror, right? And then 1870 is the modern era, basically. Do you have to deal with a lot of uh, changes in in the in, you know in the way money works in the in the institutional framework? I know the Bank of England is was founded in 1694. Did that have an impact? I for sure did, and uh, this is I do indeed discuss those changes over time. One important matter is that for the earlier period, the money supply is almost exclusively uh, made of coin supply, and in fact, in the very early periods, there's even regional means. It, it's not just uh, it's not just a, a mean centralized in London. There's other means in other parts of the country, essentially until the Tudors, and so. Uh, but but there's other in later periods also broader forms of money supply for sure, such as notes of the Bank of England and there's others. Um, only relatively late the, do deposits start to matter. But my method, uh, especially the indirect method, can be used for calculating um, those broader forms of money supply as well. Right, because we, we include not just, uh, e- even in this period, uh, not just precious metals, but uh, you know, bank deposits as a form of money, uh, you know, depending on how, how broad definition you want. And, you know, probably in 1270, there, you know, that you, those would be zero, or I, I don't know if there were any banks at that time. But by 1870, uh, that would be huge. That's right. Uh, so um, precious metals by themselves are not money. And if they're coined, they, they become money. They become, if they turn from bullion into coin. But indeed, uh, into the 19th century, uh, all sorts of bank activity starts to become much more important. From the seventh, mid-17th centuries onwards, you start to see some financial activity becoming uh, relatively important. But, but actually, coin supply is relatively dominant has a share of total money supply until relatively late and into the 18th century. Okay. So what what can you tell me about the the effect of changes in the money supply? There's been, you know, huge amount of ink spilled discussing, you know, monetary policy and and monetary uh, the effect of of money on on economies in the modern era, but uh, but when we go farther back um, and the data gets sparser, there's just less on it. Uh, so, for instance, you have some research looking at uh, at the influx of, of precious metals from the New World into Europe. Uh, so, would would adding a whole bunch of gold from the New World could we look at that with just a, a sort of standard Phillips curve argument uh, in terms of the effect on? Europe at the time. Uh, h- how do you see that? Uh, the Phillips curve is is a, is a relationship that has to do with the short term. Mm-hmm. Um, now, one reason I think that this episode is interesting is precisely because it can provide us new forms of identification. Uh, in macroeconomics, identification is very tricky. Um, so we don't have we anything like RCTs. Um, available for us. So answering b- basic questions about policy can be very complicated because we almost never have exogenous source of variation of the things that we are actually interested in understanding the impact. So for me, um, a, a lot of my empirical work on monetary history uh, has to do uh, with uh, getting the, uh, my hands on data that then can be used for analysis. If the data already existed, I would have been happy to just pick it up. Um, but for the most part, it didn't exist. It had to be constructed. Or it existed in forms that were not easily accessible. Um, so I am indeed interested in the episode of the finding of America and on all the silver and gold that was found in America and that was brought for Europe, uh, in particular because I see that as something that as providing us with a form of identification of exogenous change in money supply for Europe, because at this time, Europe's money supply, like we previously briefly touched, um, was mostly based on a commodity money, so money that needed as an input precious metals in order to be produced, 
and that input in Europe was available in relatively inelastic supply. And so when suddenly you have access to America and you have all these enormous amounts of precious metals coming in, those amounts completely dwarfed what was available. They didn't just dwarf what was being produced. They even dwarfed the stocks that already existed. And so um, that meant that um, suddenly money supply all over Europe increased. And so in the paper you are referring to, I look at the consequences of that increase for Europe's uh, GDP, both nominal and real, and and for Europe's prices at the aggregate level. Right. And uh, I mean, what we we definitely predict an increase in nominal GDP, that is GDP measured in, in currency units, right? Because there's just so much more currency, even if you're producing the same amount of, uh, you know, food or, or clothing or, or shelter and, and things people need, they're just going to end up paying more coins, more precious metals, you know, minted into into money for any given amount. This is what, what we expect. But, uh, but real GDP, um, you know, I mentioned the Phillips curve, which of course is only a, a short run thing where, where at least uh, economists some economists f- think that uh, an injection of, of money can sort of boost uh, employment and, and output in, in the short run. But in the long run, do, do you see any um, any effects on, on real GDP? Uh, and if so, positive or negative? So the strategy I've pursued is to have two separate papers in which one of which I look at the effects at the business cycle level. Um, this is the existence and persistence of liquidity effects paper. And then I have a different paper in which I look at long-term effects. The second one would be more controversial from a macro point of view. So in the, f- in the paper in which I look at the effects at the business cycle level, what I see, and they're not contradictory. They could be complementary, in fact, but they, they look at different things. So in the third paper in which I look at this historical natural experiment for the effects it had for the business cycle in Europe, what I find is that this discovery of rich mines in America in the early modern period um, led to um, increase in production in Europe in real GDP. And, and the reason that the real GDP increases is that in the first few years after there is an increase um, in money supply, prices do not respond. And so prices only start responding with a certain degree of magnitude by the fourth year. And what that means is that nominal GDP response fully initially and that full response of nominal GDP translates completely to real GDP. Uh, and, and this is consistent with the macroeconomics notion of sticky prices or uh, nominal rigidity, if you will. So it is consistent with one, what one school of macroeconomists argue exists and other macroeconomists argue sticky prices are not an important feature of reality, including Nobel Prizes three that I can count. And so uh, uh, my view challenges that view that sticky prices don't matter. And indeed, uh, our, my view is that sticky prices in the past, at least this is, I'm here only focused on internal validity for this period in the past. Um, sticky prices certainly did matter and they certainly led to uh, real GDP response. Uh, notice also that the fact that the, these economies were quite different from the economies of today is also informative about certain mechanisms through which um, money matters because some of the stories that people tell today about um why prices are sticky, often related to the nature of contracts, do not apply in this period that we talk about. So those, they suggest that there are other reasons why prices were sticky at the time. Yeah, so so you have uh, massive amounts of, of new money, uh, precious metals coming from the Americas into Spain being minted. You'd also tend to have what's called a, a Cantillon effect, uh, you know, the, a, a change in in real wealth uh, and a, a redistribution of wealth to to the Spanish and maybe away from the other parts of Europe that didn't have access to this new money. 
and it's it's a little uh, confusing, I guess, or that prices wouldn't change for. Uh, you say four years upon the you know this new influx of money. So I, I suppose people you know kept trading at the old prices. Uh, prices were prices fairly stable before this. Uh, I I gather with a with a fixed supply of uh, of money or a fairly fixed supply of of money that if anything prices would have been gradually falling before this period. Is that true? So, uh, I mean, you raised several issues. One of them is uh, what are, what is the mechanism that is generating this, right? Mm-hmm. So, there are several possible mechanisms. Uh, the re- one sort of redistribution mechanism that you mentioned is one possible mechanism. In the paper, I- I'm, I'm silent about this. The paper is focused solely on reduced farm e- effects. It shows something happen. Uh, it doesn't go in detail about why it happens, what are the mechanisms that could have led to that kind of response. For that, you need a structural model. But to respond to the, the, the second part of your question, the prices indeed were uh, in uh, were did take time to respond. That there is no question in my mind about that, and that is consistent, like I said, with what we see for modern economies. Uh, think of it this way: uh, your wage, you you have a wage, right? Yeah. Um, your wage is your wage. Is it indexed today? Uh, I do you have? A- I don't think so. I, I mean, I, I'm a graduate student, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I guess I'm under union rules, so maybe. <laughs> So notice that even in a modern economy where people are reasonably sophisticated, often wages are not indexed. Mm-hmm. And we, you could argue that this is because we are in a low inflation environment. Uh, you asked earlier if if prices were rather stable at this time of history. Actually, the answer is no. Prices varied a lot. Um, uh, historically, we see much bigger uh, variation in prices because uh, if, if the crop failed, prices would go up a lot, basically, especially food prices. So today, there's a lot more risk sharing. There's a lot more central bank action that, that does not lead let uh, prices go through violent v- variation. And so historically, prices varied a lot more. What I'm looking here is at in response to a big increase in availability of precious metals that could be uh, put into the money supply, prices did respond, but not immediately to that shock, right? They took up to four years to start responding to that shock. And then they start responding very fast after that. Um, so it, it, it seems people just take time to respond. Uh, notice people, you, people, there were no s- statistics widely available about how much money supply there was around, right? So people somehow supply and demand just worked its magic in a way that people had to understand through the market that um, there was more money around in a decentralized fashion yeah uh, and I guess with uh, with precious metals and and uh, uh, gold and in in that period money wasn't just a, a medium of exchange but it was a, a saving a means of saving as well right today you sort of you're sort of a sucker if you have money you know if you have uh, money in the bank or cash in your wallet you, what you really want or so we so we all uh, think is is you, know, you want you want your money in in stocks and bonds mutual funds you want your wealth in some kind of um, some kind of asset that generates a return. Sure. Well, I'm not sure because the rate of return per money at this time, uh, even in a low in- inflation environment or even in a deflationary environment like sometimes there was, um, uh, uh, there would be other assets that would have a rate of return that would dominate that of money. Oh, um, yeah. People mostly held money for transactions, although sure, they could they could hold some as a, as a store of value as well. Um, but I'm not sure that that was a big percentage of the total money being stored as uh, hoarded or stored as a store of value, but it, and even much less as an investment. It sure there it, it was very it was less risky perhaps than other or other assets. Mm-hmm. Um, but I cannot tell you with precision how much were people using it as a store of value. But yeah, for sure there were assets that would dominate it in in risk adjusted return. 
Yeah, and and just uh, I mean, I suppose if you're if you're in this four year period when there's just more money, but uh, prices haven't changed, you, you'd be feeling fairly wealthy. You'd uh, like everyone without this realization that their money ten years down the road won't be worth as much as as they think it will would feel like they have gotten richer. And in some sense, you know, that could have a, a stimulative effect that could affect their behavior that could lead them to, to produce more and to consume more. But in a sense, it's if you're being fooled, uh, aren't you sort of behaving suboptimally? You know, if, if, you're, if you're fooled into economic activity, isn't that economic activity going to be perhaps not the, uh, the best possible use of, of your resources? In a general equilibrium sense, well, I guess that the the answer really depends on the mechanism. Mm -hmm. So there might be that there were some losers in this, right? Here, I'm, all I'm looking is at the, what happened to the economy as a whole. And to the economy as a whole, it is uh, certain that real GDP responded positively, right? Does that mean that there were some losers in the middle? Possibly, but real overall aggregate economic activity increased, um, especially in some countries. The effect is much stronger for some countries than for others. Um, but over and indeed, it is stronger for uh, countries that that in economic history are seen as the winners over this period, especially England and the Netherlands, which are not, by the way, the first order receivers of the bullion. In Spain, there is no effect, essentially. And so, um, in order to, for me to tell in more detail uh, why this happens, we would have to go into the mechanisms. But I prefer to leave, it, leave that for future work because this is already complicated enough as it is. Um, so here I'm just identifying an effect. I'm being silent about what is generating that effect. Although I can certainly speculate. Yeah, um, well, so you have a couple papers on... You, well, you have lots of papers on economic history. Uh, you you have uh, one about uh, the contribution of empire to Portugal's economic growth, and it's in this period from 1500 to 1800. So this is the period we're talking about, like just after the discovery of the Americas and uh, the influx of, of money, precious metals at least, uh, from there. And Portugal is one of the, the leaders at the start of this period. And, of course, you know, to this day, we, we see Brazil, huge nation, uh, huge population, all speaks Portuguese because of this history. Uh, but then Portugal sort of declines. It's, it's not the, the leading force by, uh, by the, the later part of this period. It's sort of um, paled in comparison to... Uh, I guess the, the the British Empire and and others. So tell me about uh, Portugal um, and you know Portugal's empire. How did you look at that? So that paper, by the way, I should say that is co-authored with Leonor Costa and Jaime Reis. Mm -hmm. They are co-authors of that paper. Now the view that that you seem to also reflect a bit in 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 your question, the traditional view about Portugal would be that the 16th century and, and even the 15th century, which was properly the century of the dis this voyages of discovery, which then continued surely into the 16th century, uh, as Portugal arrives to India, and to China and to Brazil in the other direction, um, it, the, the, these centuries then are seen as the golden age for Portugal, right? Mm -hmm. And so, because Portugal indeed was doing something that was radically new for its time, and, and that then had, for sure, tremendous consequences for the world as a whole, uh, especially for Europe, um, and for sure for the Americas, perhaps less for Asia in an initial phase. Um, but, um, uh, but actually, this view then that Portugal in the 16th century, it was its golden age, so it must have been doing very well economically, is something that um, my co-authors and I have been trying to, uh, to show using actual quantitative data, which never existed before, that is, a, is, is false as a view. Mm -hmm. So um, actually, um, you should not extrapolate to the economy economy as a whole, something that mattered very little in, in aggregate economic terms, 
at this time, Portugal, like all other economies in Europe um, and indeed in the world, was a predominantly agricultural economy. So the agricultural sector is not in pre-modern economies as big as economies sometimes imagine. They think it's 90% of the economy. No, it's actually something like 60% of the economy or even 50% of the economy. Um, but despite the, the fact that the agricultural sector is not as big as people imagine, even in what we would call services or proto-industrial sector, a lot of it was done in the countryside in any case. And all of these sectors then, the vast majority, had nothing to do with empire or with trade. Trade, per capita trade, although Portugal's trade was very large in per capita terms, in real per capita terms, comparatively to other countries in Europe, Portugal's trade was very large through all the early modern period, including the 18th century including the 17th century when Portugal lost much of its uh, Asian empire to the Dutch, but actually did very well on the Brazil side of the empire and ultimately even kicked out the Dutch from the Brazil side of empire, which is something that uh, the, the, the historians of the Netherlands often forget, that when they sing the praises of the VOC, VOC and its success, the Dutch East India Company, its success at kicking out the Portuguese from Asia and so on. They forget that the WOC, which was the, uh, the Dutch company for the Americas, actually completely lost to the Portuguese. And so uh, this should be remembered by those that just think that Dutch institutions were superior uh, at all levels. But what I'm then saying is that in Portugal continues, on the one hand, it continues to have relatively high trade levels per capita into the all of the early modern period. So there's nothing that special about the 16th century. Other than that, they were the first. Um, on the one hand, and in for the 16th century, the trade actually was quite small. So again, the only thing about it interesting is that it appeared that it existed, and in other countries it didn't. Because it was very small, um, its share over the total economy, that again, where what mattered again is agricultural productivity more than anything else, the, the share of trade doesn't matter that much, because it's small. And in later periods, 17th and 18th century, actually trade grows a lot in real per capita terms, and then it starts to have an impact on the economy as a whole. So actually, the period in which Portugal's trade is having a bigger impact in its economy is the period that people don't call the golden age mm. for Portugal. Yeah, that's really interesting. But I mean, it aligns with my intuitions about uh, about empire and about trade. You You don't need to politically control other regions of the world to benefit from trading with them. We certainly sort of moved away from colonialism in the modern era and we're doing better than ever. Well, that's certainly true today, but uh, historically power and plenty, to quote a famous book, always come together. Um, so you, you, can, you cannot separate violence from trade historically. The, recently, maybe you can. That is quite a recent development from a historical point of view. At this time that we're talking about, it was simply impossible. Trade and violence are simply one and only. They, they are inseparable. Okay, so you, you sort of you needed to subjugate uh, you know another part of the world in order to have the the institutional framework to to trade there. Is is that essentially the point you're making? Well, it's not just about subjugations. In in uh, in many of the places, the Portuguese, just to continue with their example, were trading. They were not subjugating anybody. In some of the places, in others, they were. But it's it's about uh, protection in a, in a world of non-cooperative behavior by others, mm. right? If you don't have your own, if you don't have uh, military power, you're gonna be you you are subject to predation. Basically, and 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 you in in fact, if you do have that military power, you can use it to indeed to coerce some 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 political sides or some tribes, and then to uh, forge alliances and make trade deals essentially. 
so it was simply impossible to do it without the mili- without military and naval power. And Europe's great advantage was that uh, the military technology was more advanced, only at two levels, essentially. Ship- ships, shipbuilding and ships, they were much more advanced than anything that existed in Asia, of course, not to mention America at all, which... Uh, and the second advantage was the construction of fortresses. Uh, in interior warfare, Europeans essentially had no advantages despite firepower So that, that in Asia. So that means that actually the Portuguese Empire is always a small um, feitorias by the coast, uh, small trading stations uh, protected militarily, and it was never... A, like a continental style empire this is only possible um in 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 the asia this is only possible from the mid 18th centuries onwards which is indeed when the british start to take over india from the mughal empire and other political entities and then later on european um powers start to take over china as well and africa Ah uh, yes. So um yeah in the the previous episode we uh we talked about the colonization of Africa and one might think that with it being so close to Europe that it would have been the first thing to be colonized but uh tropical diseases uh you know and and the discovery of quinine uh played a big role that uh you could you could now go there without uh without it being a death sentence from from something like malaria on that point about um about the these uh these empires focused around the coasts and being able to to trade to control the coast and the sea but but not inland areas economically there there would be you you'd have the most interest in 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 areas you could access by sea because the transportation costs were so much lower until until really the 20th century until uh, trucking and 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 i suppose rail, rail. so at, at least from a cost benefit perspective i suppose it would it would be an advantage to to uh, control coastal areas and and uh, probably too costly uh, for for the benefit to control the inland areas. Is that? Uh, do you agree with that? Sure, of course. Both the disease environment and uh, and the cost of transportation matter. Mm-hmm. Although you might ask yourself, in in, in the case of China, um, uh, there was a, there there were canals that existed, mm-hmm. and the, the disease environment was not uh, was not negative for the Europeans. So you might ask, why didn't they start taking over China earlier uh, than the 19th century? And and my view is indeed that only when military technology uh, and and incomes as well. Uh, reach a, a, a sufficient divergence, is it possible for the Europeans to start taking over China? Yeah, and and uh, so we we see um, in the in the modern age the the places that were colonized versus the places that were were not uh, or you know were colonized either not at all or or to a lesser extent. Uh, you see the the institutions being quite different a- Africa in particular was just sort of divided up with basically arbitrary borders that didn't reflect the uh the you know the the actual people and the political arrangements that were that were there before That's Where, right. whereas China more or less uh has the you know has a continuous his- China has a continuous history going back for 3000 years and and has the same the same sort of uh controls the same area today it was not divided up well I, I don't know it depends on what you define as continuous actually china informally was divided up uh, first by the europeans then by the japanese and and so uh, and so uh, it remained nominally independent always but uh, de facto it was largely divided up right yes uh you had the uh the tr- for a while yeah for, for a while for, from uh from the uh the opium wars to i guess uh world war 2 um right so, to the end of world war 2 yeah years. that's that's 100 years so i, I guess mm. a, a long stretch of time so your you have uh some some other work uh in this area of uh of trade and international trade in the early modern period and you dis- discuss the idea that uh trade uh, on whether international um and intercontinental trade was particularly important 
Um, do, you, do you come down on the on the side of, of saying that uh, trade between continents was very important for for Europe's development, or, or maybe maybe overemphasized, less important than maybe domestic advances in production and, and uh, other factors like that? Well, I have an intermediate position. So you have people like McCloskey saying it was not important at all. Colonies are in inherently loss making and that just didn't matter. And then you have an, an uh, older historical literature that say that it mattered enormously. And uh, I cite all those papers in the Cleometrica paper that, that you, uh, and books in the case of older literature. Uh, Obsbaum, for example, thought it was uh, terribly important and Wallerstein and so on. And so my, my view is that both of those extremes, both the McCloskey side and the um, Obsbaum, uh, Wallerstein, so to say, side, uh, are, are too, too extreme. And so uh, I think that it mattered. Uh, it mattered certainly a lot more than, than static calculations would suggest. Most of the way, people like McCloskey, not just McCloskey, uh, uh, who's my friend, by the way, I, <laughs> she knows that uh, this is uh, certainly not personal, and 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 but the way that this is these people tend to look at it is from a static perspective and moki does the same is to say okay uh, what was the total percentage of trade over these economies uh, it was relatively small well if it was small it didn't matter uh, if the external sector was small it couldn't matter that much and but actually there is uh, in a dynamic sense once you take a dynamic general equilibrium view of things and once you take in consideration that there are spillovers, uh, externalities from that trade, then just that static sense of saying, okay, this is external sector is a relatively small percentage of the economy, that is not very satisfactory. You need to come up with a way to understand what kind of spillovers took place as a result of trade. How does that change the way people act, the way people think, people's incentives? And so, for example, uh, one, one thing that mattered is um, by, by generating um, agglomeration, by generating agglomeration gains, urbanization, um, one prominent example is London, uh, then you generate a sort of economy, even if it's localized in only one part of England, and which is, by the way, not even the part where the Industrial Revolution took place, but it did lead to things that in the modern sense of agglom agglomeration economies, the, the literature on agglomeration talks a lot. Uh, it started with Krugman essentially, but then uh, it went in, in, in different directions. And so there's another number of channels uh, through which it, it mattered that are not captured uh, in a static sense. And that is what I tried to get at in that paper. Yeah. And uh, of course, there are, there are huge gains to um, to urbanization that, that uh, people at the time couldn't have predicted. Uh, so so a, a lot of the industrial and technology um, growth happened in, in cities and probably couldn't have happened outside the context of cities. Um, yes, these are the sort of spillovers or externalities that result from it. Another was these new goods, the goods themselves that came from Asia. Uh, even if the goods themselves that came were never a, a very big share of the economy, they led to a policy inside of trying to replicate those kind of goods because there were things people wanted to purchase, such as porcelain. Porcelain is an example here. So even if porcelain from China was never a huge part of the economy, all of Europe in the 18th century, you start to see industries popping up, producing porcelain-like uh, goods that accelerated industrialization. And the reason they were doing that is that these were goods people wanted to purchase. So if you, if you, but those are excluded as trade figures, right? But they could not have happened if the trade 
of porcelain was not coming in. They were a result of that. Mm -hmm. And they encouraged people to participate in the market. Remember, this is a time where a lot of people still produced more or less for self-consumption. Uh, and not, not everybody, for sure. Most, many people participate in the market. But once you start having these new goods coming in, goods like porcelain, goods like tea, goods like silks coming in, uh, a lot of people that were not participating or were only participating marginally in the market want to work in the, for the market in order to purchase those goods. So they might move to cities, again, encouraging urbanizations, and especially they want to work for a wage uh, so that they can go to the market and access those goods. Again, not just the goods directly imported from Asia, but also the sort of import substitution industries that were popping up uh, has a response to that. So all of these things we're talking about, these new industries popping up, these um, these people wanting to participate in the market are indirect results of this trade, uh, namely with Asia, in the case of the example we are giving now, but they will not appear in the sort of McCloskey Mokir view of history in which you just take what is the total share of the external sector over the economy, and that's the impact. Uh, or you conclude from the fact that that, sh that share is small, that it could not have mattered. And that is my disagreement with that side of the literature. Right. So, so globalization, there's more to it than just, you know, how the volume of, of goods and, and of currency changing hands between different countries. There's, there's ideas and, um, and there's this idea from uh, Adam Smith that the, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, which I, I hear is sort of implicit in your story that, uh, that we, we, we have a, a deeper division of labor from, from, having, um, from having trade with uh, China and, and having uh, new goods that, that you couldn't make um, locally, at least at first. That's for sure. And, uh, and you also have it, this increased specialization uh, from having a more monetized economies. So in a sense, going one step back, uh, these findings of huge amounts of precious metals in America, they encouraged both those things. They encouraged trade with Asia because they were, trade with Asia was all about sending silver to Asia and bringing other goods back. I have a whole different paper on that called Spending a Windfall. And then, so they created those effects of the trade that we talked about earlier. And they also had a direct effect, those precious metals, through increased monetization. Right, uh, and and that indirect effect uh, of more liquid economies where people can more easily specialize and participate in the economy um, also mattered, and and furthermore may have mattered in the long run. Right, you much earlier you had asked me about long run effects, so we are getting to them in that sense. Notice that I don't deny that other things matter. Right, mm -hmm. it's just that the usual stories people tell are about institutions and they are about uh, geography or endowments, and they are about um, technology, right? All of those things matter, for sure. Uh, my story is more complementary to those. I say that monetary factors mattered a lot, and they and they interacted with these other factors people talk about, such as institutions and technology. Do you have any closing thoughts, uh, anything that we uh, touched on but didn't cover in enough detail, or or anything about this period that you think people should know? I would say though that um, when criticism that could be made to my view of history, so to say, is that this was uh, finding precious metals in America, whereas uh, at most leads to a level effect and not to a growth effect. Right, it it is a one-off. Although it was a sequence of time, sooner or later it would end. And there is my view that ma money matters a lot for our understanding of economies around us. Uh, holds on the fact that later on we shift to a system where central banks can provide essentially illimited uh, liquidity as long as that liquidity is still credible through the price level. And and so that shift meant that. Um, um, the provision of liquidity was no longer a problem in the way that it had been historically.
historically, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can, uh, in my view, we cannot separate the process of modern economic growth um, from a process of providing liquidity to economies. My guest today has been Nuno Palma. Nuno, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.